I told you, didn't I? It's going to get better and better, amen? I'm so grateful for Clay and Beth and just uh, what they're going to bring to our team. And they met yesterday uh, here and uh, with our worship team. And um, I'm really excited about what's happening right now in our church. And so I would just say continue to pray. I told you a couple weeks ago, you might walk in here one week and the worship is just... Um, almost a pre-rapture practice, amen, uh, where you're kind of jumping, maybe getting a chance, and then some weeks you may walk in here and go, huh, that was interesting. And uh, either way, what I want you to do is understand we're building leadership, we're building team, and so uh, we want to build people in our church. It's a discipleship process, and that's why we have Clay and Beth here to work with them. They're going to be working with them during the week and on weekends and all that good stuff. So I don't think we could have sang a more appropriate song than what we just sang. Lord, lead me to love those you love. Lead me to those that you love, because we've been in this series about what would Jesus do, and if Jesus was uh, here on the planet, walking this earth in our culture today, what would Jesus do? I mean, come on now. I mean, we think about that. We said a couple weeks ago, you know, we live in a pluralistic, multicultural society that just frowns on any prejudice. I mean, if you have an opinion, keep it to yourself or attack somebody that has a different one than you, right? And so we have these judgments and these prejudices that we have. And, and I got to be honest with you, I don't think I've ever seen a culture more divided than our culture today. Would you agree with that? Because here's what I know. is I look at our culture, and I say, I can't believe they're there. Maybe I'm getting old enough, and maybe I'm reading the Bible enough. I don't know. But I'm more aware, and I'm more convicted that I really don't like some people. And I don't like some things. And in my arrogance and my self-righteousness, I find myself being very judgmental. And maybe I'm the only one. I know none of you suffer from that. It's just my confession. Amen? (laughs) See, I think we're all secretly prone to believe that we're somehow better than others or maybe a little further along. And I don't think the church has been very healthy in this in the last few years. You see, we were reminded when we first started this series of Romans 3, chapter 10 through, or uh, verses 10 through 12, look at it, where Paul is writing, says, listen, there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All, everybody say all. All All have turned away and they have together become worthless. And there is no one who does good, not even one. And that includes everybody in this room, including me, everybody. And see, when we fail to embrace that or, or, or that humbling fact that, that, that we begin to pursue righteousness on our own, which is a grievous sin, we forget where we came from for some of us in this room because we've been saved for so long that we forgot that it allows us to justify our sin and view others as clean or unclean or healed or need to be healed, dirty and abusive, which causes us to to almost avoid offenders as if their sin's gonna jump off of them onto us. And so we just avoid them altogether and we pass our judgment on them. And we judge others and avoid them And we don't even realize we're doing it because we've been doing it so long and we've been posting for so long on Facebook the same stuff. And then we wonder what's going on. Because ultimately, here's what we're trying to do is who gets to wear the white hats and who gets to wear the black hats? You'll get a white hat, not so much you. And and I know where you come from. And I know what you've done. No black hat. No, you get a white hat. No, yeah, you get it. And you see how we start playing this game. And we start playing this game of judgmental, judging each other. And I have as many judgments as anybody in this room, trust me. Danielle and I have been talking about this on our back porch over the last few days. And we'll be talking along and we'll look at each other and go, well, that that was a judgment. Well, no judgy, big judgy here, right? You see, we talked about two types of sins when we started this. Those are those universal sins, which we're going to start looking at this month. 
And then there's those particular sins. And, and those are those offenses that are sinful for some people under some circumstances and, and, and not for all people under all circumstances. And so we kind of looked at a couple of cultural things back in the month of June. Of, and we looked at alcohol and we looked at tattoos, not because we want you to drink alcohol or get a tattoo, amen. It's just that for some of us, that's become such a big elevated sin in our culture. And all Christians are commanded to avoid universal sins. The problem is many of us have elevated all particular things to universal things. And that's where the judgment comes from when people walk into our church and they look different than us. And so what I want to do is take a closer look at some of these universal sins. Because up to this point, we've kind of looked at some freedoms. And maybe you have freedom in some areas that other people don't have freedoms in. And so you're able to enjoy some freedoms that others are not. And so it's not a sin for you, but it may be a sin for them. And if you have a freedom that you get to enjoy, and maybe you have a, a, a restriction that you can't enjoy that freedom, what we all want to do is respond in grace and love, not passing judgment so today I want to look at some things that Paul warned us about in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 6. We're going to jump back to chapter 5, but I want to look at that. Before we do, I realize that many of you in this room, in fact, we've had some people walk out over the last couple of weeks as we've been talking about some very controversial things because for some of us, we've grown up jumping through hoops and checking off boxes trying to be spiritual trying to be worthy, trying to make God love us more. And what's happened over time, see, this is why many of you left the church years ago and you've now come back because you jumped through so many hoops and you checked so many boxes that you finally just came to the conclusion that God could never be pleased. There's just no way, I can't check enough boxes, I can't jump through enough hoops. And so you just kind of came to the place where grace was squeezed out. And God was just a tyrant, a harsh teacher, an authoritarian parent that could never be pleased, or maybe a leader, or maybe an abusive husband, or just men in general. And so we just kind of checked out. And that's where some of you came from. And, and I believe that's where some of us are today. Because you're just tired because there's something I know about me and maybe you is we like lists, don't we? We like checking the boxes. But all of a sudden you realize you can't check enough, you can't make a long enough list, and you just finally come to the conclusion, God it can't be pleased. See, when you reduce Christianity down to a negative system, where all of a sudden fasting becomes more sacred than feasting, oh, the law wins out over grace every time. And when we reduce Christianity to a negative system, where correct theology becomes more important than divine encounters with a Savior who loves us. Law wins out over grace. And listen to me, when we reduce it down to a negative system, we in effect become Pharisees. But we're modern day Pharisees. We're, we're much more refined, aren't we? Yeah, it kind of hurts, doesn't it? So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 together. And let's find out what Paul was talking about in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It'll be on the screen. You can read along or maybe you have your app or your Bible this morning. Here's what Paul says. Or do you not know? He's continuing in this thought because there's something going on here. We're going to fix it to catch you up. He says, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Now, here's the background of what's going on in the church of Corinth. It's an incredible story. There's so much tension in this story, and there's so much tension. I want you to enter in with me today, because here's what's happening. It's in a Greek culture where the church has risen up. The gospel, the good news, was planted. Paul built the church there in Corinth, and the, the, the place of Corinth uh, was, was a vile place. Anything goes. And so the church began to rise up, and as the church began to rise up, people were being discipled, and people were growing. And so Paul was writing them a letter 
to them to, to do some correcting in the church of Corinth, to, to kind of do some encouragement in the church of Corinth. And, and so here's what was going on. If you jump back to chapter five, there was a man in the church who was a faithful attender. He had, he had at some point professed to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He had at some point become a leader in the church, an attender in the church. And here's what was going on. He was sleeping with his father's wife, not his widow, his wife, a sex triangle, incest at its core. And some of you think the Bible's boring. <laughs> Amen? Go back to chapter 5, verse 1. Look at it. Here's what Paul says. It's actually reported that there is a sexual immorality among you. And a kind that even pagans don't tolerate. See, in that day, this was so dark. Not in our day, because we know our day, that's just normal, right? But in that day, pagans didn't even do this. This was dark, man. He says, a man is sleeping with his father's wife. And if that's not twisted enough, if that's not dark enough for you, and you may be saying, ah, the Bible's boring. Check out the next part. Because the church was okay with it. Look at it. And you are proud. Everybody say proud. Doesn't even feel right saying it, does it? And it shouldn't. He said, shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who's been doing this? And so Paul here, as he's starting this letter, he's coming into this section of Scripture and the letter that he's writing to Corinth, and he's beginning to do some correction. He's even doing some rebuking, amen, and teaching on the subject of purity and sexuality. Something the church has shot away with because somewhere along the journey, the church shot away from sexuality and purity and we just said, don't do it, which made it nasty and gross and that's why many marriages today are unhealthy because somewhere along the way, the church quit addressing the sexuality of men and women. <laughs> and so Paul here is addressing sexual identity that God has given us as human beings. You see, we know that all scripture is, is God-breathed, amen? It's useful. Look at 1 Timothy 3.16. It's good for teaching. It's good for rebuking what some call yelling at you, amen? Huh. Get on Facebook, man. A lot of rebuking that's not of Jesus. Can I just say that? But that's where the church is going today. We're going to yell at them until they change. How's that working for you? Right? It's for teaching, rebuking correcting, and then training in righteousness. So here's what Paul's doing with the Corinth church. He's teaching them. He's teaching them. And yeah, it, there's a little bit of rebuke here. Guys, you shouldn't be proud about this. That's a rebuke, right? And then he's correcting them. And then we're going to see he's training them in righteousness. So see, when we teach the Word of God, or you come to the Word of God, you come to Scripture you got to understand that what Scripture will do is it'll teach you. And sometimes it'll rebuke you. Maybe not the way your old preacher did or your old husband did or your mama or your uncle or whatever when they yelled at you. Or not even the way that we see it on Facebook where we write in all caps because that really shows you're mad. <laughs> but the Scripture has a way of rebuking us. But it also corrects us and trains us in right living. 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and 8, Paul continues. He says, your boasting is not good. Everybody say, not good. not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough, he says? He says, get rid of the old yeast so that you may be new unleavened bread as you really are. Notice the teaching. Notice rebuking. Notice what he's doing. Are you picking this up? He says, look, man, get rid of the old yeast so that you may be new unleavened bread as you really are. Listen to the love in that. Listen to the, the compassion in that. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened, with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In other words, those old habits and sin, they're not only bad, but those things you're trying to now put into your life because you've been made new. It's like a little bit of yeast in a batch of dough. It goes through the whole loaf. 
And so what we try to do is, is, in, is we try to figure out what's good and what's bad. And here's what Paul's saying. Don't you know you've been made new? Take and remove all those things and put them behind you. Because you've now been made new, live out of that new, but you've not been patched up as if we can go through and take the yeast out of it. You know what happens when you start trying to, you can't. You can't pick out the bad yeast. You can't pick out the yeast because I, I'm not a baker. And it's, I think you, you're shaking your head like, yeah, because you get it. I know, but I know this. You can't pull the yeast out once it's in because it affects the whole batch. So that's why Jesus said, look, I'm throwing out the old. The old is gone. The new has come. You're now a new loaf. Start living out of that. He's teaching them. We're more than just passed up. We're made new. He's saying you're a new lump of bread, completely new, no yeast, no sin, forgiven. Why? By the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we've been made new. And then he goes on and gets a little stern in this. In verses 9 through 11, he says this, I wrote to you in my letter. See, Paul had written them another letter in the Corinth church. There's actually three. We only have two, but we know here that he's written them a letter before, and he's referring back to that. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims, everybody say claims, claims, claims to be a brother or a sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or a slanderer or a drunkard or a swindler. Don't even eat with such people. See, Paul here is saying, he's not saying not to associate with anyone who continues to practice immorality. Before you jump to conclusions, Notice what he's saying in verse 10. You kind of giggled there. For those people that's never given their life to Jesus Christ, who are sinners, amen? Okay, so here's how Paul describes them. He describes them as swindlers, idolaters, the immoral. He's not saying have nothing to do with them because then you would have to die. Or, or hang on, hang on, hang on. Or you'd have to go live in a cave by yourself. You couldn't take your spouse, right? You couldn't take your kids, the little sinners, Amen? You, you would have to go live by yourself if that's what Paul was saying. That's not what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. If you have an unrepentant believer, a so-called follower of Jesus Christ, and they're not willing to struggle or stop the immoral behavior, have nothing to do with them. And there's the tension. Don't miss the tension there. There's an incredible tension right there in the passage. And I want you to feel the tension. Look at verses 12 and 13. He says, what business is it of mine to judge? Everybody say judge. Yes. To judge those outside the church. Wait, we're not supposed to judge, really? Really? Isn't that what we're always taught? Don't you judge me. Isn't that what I started with? I got all these judgments, right? So Paul says, look, man, quit judging them that don't claim to have a relationship with Jesus. Look what he says next. Are you not to judge those inside? Uh-oh. Uh oh, look what he says. God will judge them, but expel the wicked person from among you. Oh my gosh. Do you feel the tension? <laughs> when do you expel that wicked brother? At what point do you say enough is enough? And then think about this. Then you jump over to 2 Corinthians 7, 10 through 13, where Paul is talking about a godly repentance and a worldly repentance. So at what level of repentance is required for it to be real, right? All of a sudden, this thing is just full of tension, isn't it? But Paul says, expel them. And so what's happened with the church is you let anybody that sins, and gratefully, I'm thankful that Summit Heights is not this church, but for the church universal, you let somebody sin, bam, we're going to shoot our wounded. You're done. You're out. And there's so much tension here. You see, part of the problem, I think, is, is that we've kind of created this hierarchy of sin with sexual sin being at the top. Let's go back to chapter 6. Let's read it again, and I want you to read it with fresh eyes here now that you kind of understand where Paul's coming from. 
And then look at what he says in verse 9 again, 1 Corinthians 6. He says, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. The sexually immoral, nor adulter, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So there's the list. Everybody loves the list, right? So build your list, put little boxes beside it, check it off, make sure you're not one, right? <laughs> so let's go through them, let's look at them, because I know none of us in this room fall into that list, right? Because none of us are sexually immoral. Let's have a little confession. How many secret porn users are in the room? <laughs> I know, right? Some of you did he just ask that? <laughs> yeah. Any swingers in here? <gasps> you think I'm kidding. Can I just be honest with you as a pastor? That 14 years ago, I didn't even know what that was until people started confessing it in my office as your pastor. Feel the tension in the room, amen? But I know that's none of you, okay? So let's look at the next one, idolaters. See, we don't have little statues because we're much, we're much more refined Pharisees, right? We don't have Joe Boo sitting there, you know what I'm saying? Some of you know what that movie is, some of you don't. Some of you are scared to laugh right now. But we have idols nonetheless, don't we? Sports, money, celebs, career, success. And I go on, but hey, that's none of you, so let's move on. Adulterers, uh-oh. There's no adulterers in this room, right? But didn't Jesus say that if you look upon a woman in a lustful way, <gasps> Dirty old man. Well, I think that can include women too. But that's none of you, so let's move on, okay? How about this next one, right? Men who have sex with men or homosexuals. What about women who have sex with women? Paul didn't mention that, so is that okay? No. Let me go on record. No. But some would argue the point. Because our culture says it's more acceptable for two women to be lesbians than it is for two men to be gay. And some will even argue the point that it's only the homosexual offender, not the homosexual. And so our culture has become twisted in that. So what does the Bible say? But I know none of you struggle with that in this room, so let's move on. Thieves. There's no thieves in the room because nobody's ever cheated on their taxes, right? Right? Because none of you are greedy, right? None of you fall in this category because you all give your portion to God. You don't ever stop tithing, right? Never. All of you truly do your best. You sacrifice your time, resources, everything. You would never steal. But that's none of you, so let's move on. How about this one, drunks? Now, this one's a little bit easier to define, isn't it? But let's just say for argument's sake, how drunk do you have to be and how often to be a drunkard? Come on. Is it just two beers and then that's it? Is it a bottle of wine? Is it two bottles of wine? Or how, oh, hang on, no, no, that's, no, no don't, don't, don't meddle. It's the liquor. It's the hard stuff. Hmm. But nobody struggles with that in here, so let's move on. How about slanderers? Nobody, right? Because no one in here has ever shared something, posted something, tweeted something, or texted a trusted friend, of course, a false charge against someone or a half-truth or a misrepresentation of someone that you're mad at or agree with. Nah. Nobody's ever done that, right? Feeling a little tension in the room. So let's move on because that's not y'all. It's not me. How about swindlers? Nah, nobody ever fits into this one, right? Because no one's ever cheated someone or told a half-truth or flattered someone to get what you want or position yourself in society a little bit better. And no one in here would ever defraud your family of an inheritance and keep it all for yourself. Nah, let's just move on. Mm. Y'all yeah, want to come back and lead worship? It's really quiet, amen? <laughs> I know what some of you are thinking. Come on, Ed. Really? I mean, Really? Because, Edward, honestly, you've really got them out of order. And, and honestly, Paul had them out of order. So let's, let's, let's simplify the universal sin. Y'all ready? I, I'm going to simplify it for you because this is where the church has come down. Basically, don't be a homosexual and don't be sexually immoral. And we'll work on the rest. Isn't that what we've done? 
I mean, think of the way we disciple young believers. The very first thing we do is when we're going to clean them up, we're going to address their sex life, right? We never worry about how they spend their money, how, how they relationship to the poor. We never worry about gossip. We never worry about their temper. No, the only thing we're concerned about is their sexuality. As if that's all that God's concerned about. And I'm not sure where we got this or how we got here. I mean, maybe it's because Paul if you continue to read in chapter 6, talks about sexual sins of having different consequences. It's a sin against the body. And we understand that. He tells us that sexual sins are made against the body. They have an eternal dimension to them. And maybe that's where we've elevated all other sins, that sin above all other sins. Look at verse 11. I love what Paul said after he kind of runs through these. And I know that's none of us, right? Because we all go to verse 11. He says, and that's what some of you were, <laughs> right? So now that we're all clear, right? There's nobody in the room that falls in that list. And that's what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Here, Paul is saying, yes, that's what you were. Don't ever forget that's what you were, church. Don't ever forget that's what God saved us from. <laughs> and we've been made new, we've been justified, we've been sanctified, we've been purified by the work and the person of Jesus Christ on the cross. Look at verse 12. And Paul gets... All up in their grill. Feel the tension. He says this. You say, well, I have the right to do anything. But not everything, he says, is beneficial. And then Paul comes back and goes, you know what? I have the right to do anything. But I will not be mastered by anything. Oh, come on. Come on. That's bold. Paul said, I can do anything. Oh, oh, you can do it? Well, guess what? I can do anything. Oh, oh you, you, you can do it? Well, guess what? I can too. But listen to me. Here's the difference between me and you. Here's the difference between me and you. I ain't going to be mastered by anything. I'm not going to let anything master me because I've already been mastered by Jesus. <laughs> do you know who you are? He just looks at him and says, you know, I can do anything I want to do. Because I know my standing in Christ. He's made me new, past, present, and future sins. But he comes back in that same breath and says, look, not everything is beneficial. Listen to me, students. Listen to me, young adults. Listen to me, singles. Listen to me, married people. Yes, in Jesus, you are free. But not everything you do is the wisest decision. You need to stop approaching things. Well, I can do what I want to do. I can just do whatever I want to do. By the way, in the end of the book of Judges, go read the last verse. In those days, there was no king, and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. How'd that work out for Israel? It ain't going to work out any better for you. Okay? He said, I have the right to do anything, but I'm not. I'm not going to be mastered by anything. Because, see, we all have this proclivity that we want to do anything we want to do. We want to do what's right in our own eyes. And we know in any other arena that doesn't work. It doesn't work in the classroom. It doesn't work at work. It doesn't work in raising kids. It doesn't work in any other arena. But, hey, when it comes to my spirituality, I want to do what I want to do. Because it's just all a particular sin. But for y'all, it's universal. For me, it's particular. Isn't that kind of where we get jacked up? Look at verse 19. He says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you receive from God? You're not your own. You say that with me. You are not your own. Say it one more time. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So here it is. We have this mandate to honor God, right? And we get that. We understand that on most levels. But here's, 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 here's what I want to challenge you with this morning. What do you do with those who are struggling in that list? And just in case I didn't name your sin or Paul left out your sin, okay? What do you do with people that are struggling 
that call themselves believers? Do we immediately expel them? And it doesn't take very long to learn in our culture that you may have a family member who's struggling with the same sex attraction. What Paul called homosexuality. How long do you struggle with them? What is the struggle with them? You see, it doesn't take long to figure out we've not done real well as a church in this area and how we've handled that issue in our culture. And and by the way, we're not doing a good job of it even now. That's why the tension in this room is so great, even right now. The reason is we've elevated sexual orientation to the highest level of sin, and we've deemed a group of people that's growing in our culture as evil and untouchable, as if their sin's going to jump off of them and onto us. (laughs) not sure where we come to this conclusion or how we really got here, but we're here. A couple weeks ago, Danielle and I were watching Mississippi Burning, that movie about racism in our country, in the South. And I got to be honest with you, I was appalled that night, that just 60, 70 years ago, that we as humans could hate someone so dark just because their skin was a different color. Disgusting. Evil at its core. Sinful. And can I just say the church was right in the middle of that? I went to bed that night and my heart was torn. How did we get there? How are we still there on some levels? I don't know. How can we get there? And yet, I'm not sure how we got there, but we're here. Not with skin color, but gender. See, here's what I know. Our whole world is broken. You're broken. Do you hear me, church? I'm broken. And we've come to this place where every human being on the planet is not only broken, we're sexually broken. You go, well, I'm not. I'm straight. Good for you. So am I. But listen to me. That's our orientation. I've been doing marriage counseling for over 30 years, and I've sat with couples in my office who have a sexless or near sexless marriage. And they use sex to punish the other. And somewhere along the way, they think that's okay. And then you'll judge someone who struggles with their identity. And the whole time, you'll hold out on your spouse and call it good because your sin is different from their sin. Now, it got really quiet in here, didn't it? We're broken. You can't call that healthy You can't call that God gave us the gift of sexuality in our marriage to enjoy and then to abuse it and say that's okay, but two men and two women being together is not okay. You call that healthy? I call that broken. Call it broken. See, we're all broken. Everybody's orientation is disoriented and broken to some level because some of you were sexually abused as a child and that has led you to where you are today. Some of you have had things happen to you and talked into you and even done to you that's atrocious. It's broken. You see, I believe in deep inside our brokenness comes Because we realize that God's design was that he created us in his image. And because that image was broken in sin, it now separates us. Our brokenness separates us. And we run into our effort and indulgence in 1 Corinthians 6 and 9. And here's what happens for all of us. This is why men try to control and try to create and try to dominate and try to overcome. is because we're trying to fix our brokenness and effort, but it leads right back to brokenness. 
And some of you will go do shopping and, and do indulgence and do all these things and you think that's gonna fix you and it leads right back to brokenness. And some of you go into that other stuff that we've listed today. Well, that'll fix me. And yet everything leads back to brokenness. Because there's something in us that longs to be made right. That God's design and his love, he created us in his image so that you and I could be in relationship with him. And sin entered the world and separated, and now we see brokenness. You don't have to believe this, but I guarantee you, if you're in this room, it doesn't take you long to figure out the world is broken. Amen? Here's why I believe it's broken, because we are created in the image of God to be in relationship with him. But when sin entered the world, brokenness now is where we are. We live in this whole idea for those of us who have placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that out of our brokenness, we realize that there was another way to repent and believe that we are no longer all of these things that now through Jesus, through his death and through his resurrection, just in case you missed it, but through his death and his resurrection, that he is the king and the Lord of lords. And by us taking and repenting and believing and putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are redeemed, we are made new, we have life, we are restored. But there's something about, I'm going to be honest, that we are very much whole and broken at the same time, aren't we? Very much whole and broken. We're not yet fully complete because there's another action required, and that's the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to complete what he started in us. Amen? Amen. See, we kind of live in what's been called the now and the not yet. We're saved, but we're also being saved. That's what we were talking about last week, that tension. In fact, look at uh, Philippians 2.12. He says this, Therefore, my dear friends, as much as you've always obeyed, not only my presence, but now more my absence. Look at what he says right there, these words. Continue. Everybody say continue. Continue, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, you have been saved, you will be saved, and you are being saved. Amen? It's a past, it's a future, but there's also a present tense of salvation. The hard thing is to live in that tension of the now and not yet. And how we negotiate that tension defines not only our lives in so many ways, but it also defines how we respond to others to be saved. We have to return to him in repentance with all of our broken parts, to reorient our lives towards God. And that means accepting the logic of the biblical narrative about our waywardness, that we are broken, that we are running towards sin. We're not running towards God, that we are broken. And only through Jesus Christ in the biblical narrative are we made right and God's design and we are restored. But there's a right now and a not yet that we live in. And there's the tension. There's the tension that we are. You see, repentance involves accepting our broken condition and looking at Jesus to fill the gaps. You can't come to God on your own terms because it all leads back to brokenness. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Except through me. Humility, surrender. There's no room for self-justification. Every human being in this room or in the world, has to turn to God through Jesus Christ. And this is important because it applies to all of us, and it means aligning ourselves with God's purposes and design. And that's also true of our sexuality. It's true of any other aspect of our life. And we must turn with all that we are, sexuality including, in order to receive grace. And no one is excluded in this. There's no room for self-righteousness. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the time, as my youth pastor used to say before he went home to be with the Lord, we're just a bunch of beggars showing another beggar where to find food. Amen? I'm just a beggar. And I'm just telling you where to find food because I found it. And his name's Jesus. You see, the Bible didn't give us all the answers to the questions raised on Facebook or the Internet. 
But I do know this, that our God is good. And that one day I'll understand. In the eternal perspective, I'll figure out my particular limp. Amen? Because I've got one. And so do you. So don't judge me because I confess that. And don't judge my sweetheart because she confessed that this morning. Because we all have a particular limp. And in the eternal perspective, we'll find out what that is. The question is not whether we'll experience pain. The question is, will we allow it to bring us to the foot of the cross? Will our pain lead us to the cross or will it lead us to more brokenness? Because see, brokenness leads to brokenness. Only through repentance and believing on the name of Jesus Christ, you are no longer who you are. You've been restored. You've been made new because of the work and the person of Jesus Christ. So here's where we're heading over the next few weeks. You ready for this? We've already established that the South, the rural Midwest, along with the church, has a bias against sexual sin. Amen? Especially same-sex relationships. So let me ask you a few questions. How do you respond to those that we're in relationships in our lives that maybe struggle with that? Do we reject them? Do we avoid them? Scared that that sin might jump off on you? Or do we rebuke them and constantly preach to them or just yell at them on Facebook? I know. Can someone who's saved and redeemed still struggle with same-sex attraction and be a follower of Jesus Christ? See, some of those, there's going to be some of the things we talk about in the next few weeks, and I'm telling you, there's a lot of tensions in that. And, and, and I want to challenge you before you jump to your conclusions and go home and write your email to me to let me know that I'm wrong and you're right. Can I just ask you to stay with me for four weeks until August the 4th? Don't run home and judge me. (laughs) Because I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to tell you this right now. I've been challenged more over the last five weeks, six weeks, as I've studied this. And I've looked at our culture. And I want you to listen with a heart of loving people. Not jumping to conclusions. Well, Edward, if we love them, then we're, we're saying we approve of them. No, come on. You love people who are adulterers. You love people who are greedy, and you don't even know they're greedy. Some of you are porn addicts in here, and nobody knows. And, man, you're just loved on like crazy. It's amazing all of a sudden when it comes out, we get judgy McJudgy, don't we? So I'm just going to challenge you not to. See, I think that's why the church has resorted to those simplistic answers without really appreciating the complexity of our culture, that there is good news for our culture, and his name is Jesus. Instead, we just say, don't. Stop it. Get over it. And there's no love in that. There's no passion in that. It seems to me when I look at Jesus and his assessment of sin, it looks very different from the Puritan code that many of us live by. Because we're tempted to put sexual sin at the top of the pile, and yet Jesus names greed and pride. (laughs) Money and wealth, not sex, were at the top of Jesus' list. And when we look at sexual sin and we look at these things that are going on, it seems that Jesus was way more merciful and gracious to them than we are. Think about the Samaritan woman. Think about the woman caught in adultery. Think about the woman, the prostitute that anointed Jesus See, we've been asking what would Jesus do over the last month, and maybe, just maybe, we should be asking in the church, who would Jesus diss? Who would Jesus diss? (laughs) Would he diss the people that many of us do today? Some of our judgments about the other side, those atheists, those agnostics, those liberals, that mainstream media, the LBGT community, they're attacking us, preacher. Well, the fact is, I would say dissing needs to stop on both sides. But it needs to start with the church. It needs to start with us. We need to stop scapegoating people and pushing people out and realize, do you really think that was Jesus' strategy? Do you really think it was Jesus' strategy to diss someone? Oh, you're good, but you're not. I mean, we got to live with adversity and practice and orthodoxy. A couple of weeks ago, I gave you this statement. Our theology is like a skeleton. 
a necessary foundation. But if it's the only thing visible about our faith, we are malnourished and dead. That it's time for the church to hang some muscle on our theology. And not just say, this is what we believe, get over it. The gospel is good news, church. <laughs> the gospel is good news. It's to redeem the broken. It's to restore the broken. It's to bring newness to the broken. It's to bring life to the broken. Because listen to me. Let me tell you what happened on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, here's what happened. This right here was canceled. That we no longer have to pay the penalty of brokenness and sin. That we can be made new only through the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And guess what? Guess what, church? These people right here, they need to know the good news. And if we stop having a conversation with them, then we have no relationship with them. If we don't have a rela- conversation with them, we don't have a relationship with them. Jesus never shied away from the conversation. Never. You see, redemption is the mission. Not being right. <laughs> Not casting stones. I mean, think about this and we'll close. I want to ask Clay and the team to come up. Think about this when it comes to our judgment. I read this this last week. What if it was true? That God has positioned Summit Heights, listen to this, 200 feet away from hell. What if we're 200 feet away from hell? A place for those on their way to hell who are struggling with faith. And the last stop for them is right here at Summit Heights. And what if it was said about us? If they can't survive Christianity here, they can't survive it anywhere. (laughs) Wouldn't that be good? What if we became a place that people could survive Christianity because we understand it's about restoration, redemption, and newness, and life, and we are all over your brokenness? Well, guess what? We're about 20 feet from hell, amen? And so when people start walking through this door, yeah, ladies, you're going to have to hold your purse a little bit tighter, Amen? Don't leave your phone laying on your chair to save your seat because it might get stolen. You want to know why? Because broken people do broken things. That's why the good news is the gospel. Because Jesus restores, makes new, and redeems. That's who you were. You're not that anymore. And someone went into your brokenness and they weren't scared your brokenness was going to jump off on them like some germ. No, they just loved you and told you the good news that Jesus Christ loves you just like you are. He's not some mean tyrant or your ex-husband or just men in general. He loves you. He died for you so that you may be forgiven. Let's pray together. Father, I love you. And I thank you for Jesus. And Father, I thank you that you were not afraid to address cultural issues. You weren't afraid of our sexuality. You weren't afraid of our greed. Idolaters, adulterers, swingers, drug addicts. You just weren't afraid, God. You stepped into our brokenness so that we may know you. So God, I pray for someone this morning that's maybe never given their life to Jesus that this would be their day to surrender to you. They've never repented and believed. And today, God, they would leave their brokenness and they would believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, I pray for those in this room that we've done that, but God, we're so full of judgment and yet we found ourselves in every one of those lists. Oh, God, please grant forgiveness and repentance. May we cry out to you and come to the altar and respond in humility and brokenness. God, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. 
I'm going to ask this morning for our prayer team and our elders who are here to come to this front and line up across this front. And I want to invite the rest of you, maybe this morning, you need, just to, you need to come down here and confess, you know what, I need Jesus. I've never repented and believed. And they want to lead you to Jesus. And maybe this morning you just need to be prayed over because you found yourself in that list. And there's a little bit of leaven still there. There's a little bit of yeast still there. And you need to leave that behind and mortify the flesh so that you may live in the newness of Jesus. And and then maybe for the rest of us, I want to invite you to take communion this morning, to worship God. If you're a believer in this room this morning, we invite you to take communion, the blood and the body of Jesus Christ that was sacrificed for us. So let's stand together and we're going to respond. I'm going to ask our prayer team and, and those leaders to come across the front and be ready to receive people. We're going to take communion and then Clay and Beth are going to close this out in song after we're done. Let's respond this morning. You come. Come on.